Uh, I've got to try to find something to blow these pots out. <clears throat> Well, I don't do that as final song that reaches my limits. <laughs> Here we go. Why me, Lord? What have I ever done to deserve even one of the pleasures I've known?
time in the world I can't remember. I got a list of things I asked God for before I ever come up here. And I forgot to ask him about humility. He said that all on his own. Today, uh, what we got? God won't give you more than you can handle. Raise your hand if you said it. Raise your hand if somebody told it to you. All right, so I like to play this little game with this part called Is It in the Bible or Is It Not? But before I ask you that question, I want to show you some scripture. Let's go to Matthew chapter 5. How many of you have read the Beatitudes? Jesus sitting there up on the mountain, giving it out to his homeboys. This is one thing that he said to him right there. You have heard it said uh, to those of old, you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery in his heart. Tough words from Jesus. Next scripture, Matthew 5, 29. 
If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you, for it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than your whole body be cast into hell. Thanks, Jesus. Apparently we're not taking this literally, right? Next scripture, Matthew 5.30. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you, for it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. More tough words from Jesus. So now let's go back. Does God give us more than we can handle? Now you can answer. What do you think? Yeah. Yes. 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 Absolutely. Definitely He does. So at the best, that little saying that He that we heard is a half truth at best, very best. So I think the scripture that probably has been misquoted that we get that little saying from comes from First Corinthians. Let's go and look at it. No temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man. But God is faithful and will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation you will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. The church of Corinth. Okay? Let's get some context because that's the whole, that's the whole thing of everything in the Bible. Okay? So... One thing that I really like about Andy is he brings up some history and some trivia with the songs that he sings. He knows about it. Okay? I'm a fan of music, like all genres of music. I really like the history of it. I like, that's one thing I like to do for entertainment. I start looking up the stories that go with some of my favorite songs. I like to know what the person was thinking, what they were feeling, what they were going through. And whenever I find out some of the stories that goes along with my favorite songs, it gives me more of an appreciation for my favorite song. Most of the time, I even I start to like it even more. And so, I'm real not I'm not really a big history buff, but whenever I find out these stories that goes along with those things, then I have context of the song. And so, one of the problems that I have experienced personally with Christianity is that the context of the Bible and God's relationship with the people here on Earth. Uh, has been taught mostly wrong in my opinion. And I used to be a little bit more bitter about it than I am right now, but my main uh, concern right now is that if you feel that way, if you have ever felt like uh, the Bible is condemnation, shame, and guilt, then I want to introduce you to who Jesus really is because religion has put a filter on the Bible that is full of that condemnation. Okay? Well, the Bible clearly states that there is no condemnation for those that are in Jesus Christ. And so what I ask you to do is that you remove that old filter and that you get some real context for the Scripture that you are reading. Now, it's real easy just to pull a Scripture out of a passage with not having any context of it and make it fit whatever purpose that a person is wanting to make it fit. And lots of times people are doing this by picking out different translations of the Bible to make that passage read the way that they want it to read. So let's go back and let's think about the church at Corinth. The church at Corinth was made up of born-again believers that were labeled pagans before they become Christians. And pagans was they were not Christians and they're definitely not Jews. And so they had some weird ways of worship. Now they were still worshiping, but they had temple prostitutes. They had a different whole bunch of big long list of gods and goddesses that they were worshiping and they had a real long messed up history of sexual immorality, gluttony, uh, drunkenness. This was just their way of life and that's the way that the whole town of Corinth was. It was just one big messed up immoral place. And so Paul on his second uh, missionary journey, he went there to Corinth and he started that church up there. And so the people that he had to start that church with, were they were brand new converts. And that's... They were coming out of this pagan way of life. And then he was dropping them into the Christian church and trying to show them that they have this new birth and that they have this unending love of, of Jesus Christ. And this is all very, very hard for them to believe because they didn't know anything but just religion before them. And so they go to church and you're around a certain group of people and they're trying to do better and they're trying to get their life straight and do all these things that Paul says that they need to be doing. And then as soon as you step outside, much like our world today, the world is just messed up. And so all they had outside of the church walls was temptation. 
And so they have so much of that influence outside the church walls and there was nothing but those type of people that was inside the church. There really wasn't even any real good, long-time established leaders. So you come into the church, that temptation's still there. Because that's all that those people had known. Now I'm not condemning them because we probably couldn't do any better. But that was their lifestyle. That was all that they knew. And so, knowing that about the church at Corinth, verse 10 that they're talking about right here in the first letter that Paul wrote to them, he was talking about temptation in them. Now, whenever we uh, go back and we hear that, that saying, God won't give you more than we can handle, that's always a way for us to try to encourage somebody. And encouragement among Christian people and amongst family, that's great, man. That's, that's, the best. that's what we're here for. We need to be encouraging people. And that's always a way for us to, to try to sound godly whenever somebody's going through some hard times. And that's a way for us to try to, you know, just make them feel better and just give them every little thing that we can. And usually, we don't know what we need to be saying. I know I don't. I don't even try anymore. If you're going through a hard time, I'll tell you. I don't know what I'm supposed to say, but I've got your back. I'm your friend. That's the only thing I know to do most of the time. Because I've been told stuff like this before. And it doesn't make me feel better. Lots of times this has given me kind of a messed up view of God. Okay? Let's get into this a little bit more. So, Paul is saying right there that this is temptation that we're dealing with. This is not tragic, tragic circumstances. This is not pain. This is not suffering. As much as the context of the saying that we were looking at today. So we can't even really compare these things because... This is apples to oranges. And if you guys know of another scripture in the Bible that may be as closely related to our saying that we started out with, please let me know. But that's the closest one that I could figure out that that saying is, is tied to. But so whenever we get correct context of the scripture, we see that it's not even close to being the same thing. And so we all go through hard times. Paul said a whole bunch of times, he said, man, don't be surprised whenever it happens. If anybody, he knew about hard times. That dude had been thrown in jail. He was actually in jail whenever he wrote this letter. He'd been in jail. He'd been shipwrecked. Uh, man, he'd been beat 39 times, a couple different times. He'd been stoned. All these different things that happened to Paul, suffering for the gospel. So he knew all about hard times. But these people he was writing the letter to right there, he was telling them that you're always going to have another choice whenever it comes to sin. God is never going to leave you in a place where sin is your only option. That's what he was telling them right there. And so since we're talking about sin, let's talk about this. We're still in the flesh. We are still prone to temptation. We still fall. We still mess up. We still make mistakes. We still let people down. We misinterpret things people say to us. People misinterpret things we say to them. Miscommunication is a problem with relationships. Things around us are hard. It's hard to keep a harmony flowing correctly around us like what makes us happy. But never ever are we going to be forced into a situation where we have to sin. And the sin itself is not where the power is. Okay, let's understand this. Let's, let's isolate sin exactly how it needs to be isolated. If you feel like you have a problem with sin, get this. You acting out in your sin is not where the power is. If you decide to go out and blow your life savings, and I don't think anybody decides to do that, but if you have to go to the casino and lose everything that you had saved up, the power is not in you doing that. The power is weeks, days, or months, whatever, before you go and do that. Those little conversations that we have with ourselves where we give ourselves permission to open the door just a little bit is where the power is at. I don't, I'm not the only one here that talks to myself. I've heard y'all when y'all don't think anybody was listening. Okay? I had these little conversations. Well, it would be all right if I did this just once or a little bit. I can try it for a little while. Different things like this. That is where the problem is. That's the temptation. And Paul's telling them right here in this verse right here, he says, through Jesus, through the power that you have through the new birth, because you are a brand new creation, you have everything you need to put that behind you where it needs to be. 
There will not ever be a time that you have to move forward in sin as a new creation. Never. We have everything that we need. And so the context of all of this is, is that we have everything that we need already through our Savior Jesus Christ. And so we don't ever have to feel like we're backed into a corner. We don't ever have to feel like we are powerless as a new believer. As a, as a person of the world, you are powerless. There is nothing in the world that you can do about your sin at all. In our flesh, we don't have the power. In our human form, it's not there. But whenever we take on the new birth and we become the new creation, we have everything at our disposal that we need to be holy and righteous all the time. All the time. We're going to mess up. We're going to have mistakes. But we have everything that we need. And so you guys know that um, I, like to, I like to make sure that we pay attention to the things that Paul doesn't say just as much as we say pay attention to the things uh, that he does say. But let's take, uh, check out James 1.13. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. Y'all heard that little analogy of like, I don't know, taking some metal and putting it through a fire and beating it around, shaping it and molding it into whatever it needs to be. Y'all ever heard that? That's how God is going to do that with us? That's never made me feel better. I don't need to be heated up and beat around. To make me into something better. Okay? I don't think you guys do either. So I don't think that God looks at a human life that He created, that He put here on this earth, like we would look at a piece of metal. Number one, we're not just objects. We are the object of His love. We are the focus of all of His uh, emotions. Uh, everything that we are is what God is about. We are His prized possession. Now, we're not saying that with a big head. Or make us feel like we're more than what we are. But we are Jesus' glory. So we need to understand that human life is very, very special. But to think that God would ever put us into a bad situation. So that we might come out on the other side and be a little bit better. Is a messed up way of thinking of God. He's not going to melt you down so He can recreate you. If you've already been through the new birth then you got everything that you need and the punishment was taken away from you, not given to you because He poured it out on Jesus. And so I, I, don't, I don't buy into all this stuff of Jesus just treating us like a, an object. And anytime that we think that we're tempted and we're going to be tempted all the time and as a matter of fact, the, the sin is not being tempted because Jesus Himself was tempted. But we need to understand that God is not the one that is tempting us. It's coming from the other side. And whenever we fall, it's not God's fault. Okay? So, we have everything that we need. Now, let's take a look at some of the things that Paul is not saying in the Scripture. Paul is not saying that God is going to give us tragic, terrible circumstances. He's not going to do that. You go back, let's roll that back to 1 Corinthians. Take a look at it while I'm sitting here talking. And nowhere in this... Does it even infer or imply that God might be doing something bad for you? Now this way of thinking that God is going to allow some bad over here and He's going to run around back behind you and whisper over here in this ear, hey man, I've got you, don't worry. That's a messed up view of God. God's not doing bad things. And we need to change our perspective. Okay, Bad things are going to happen because we're living in the world. But God's never causing them. God's never doing them. God has not done anything but put His love towards you. And Paul is not saying that God is going to give you a whole bunch of bad stuff and then take you right up to your breaking point and then come bail you out. And I've been taught that and I believed that for a long time. That God was just piling stuff up on me to see how much I could take. But whenever bad things happen, they're... Are there, they will uh, definitely benefit us if we allow them to. But in the correct context, we need to know where they're coming from. Definitely not coming from God. So, will God give you more than what you can handle? Yep. Yep. But, 
God will help us handle all that we have been given. How about that? I like that a lot better. Philippians 4.19. Close with this. We'll get into our communion. Again, we are new creations. If we ever say or think or feel like we don't have what it takes to make it, then we are denying the fact that we are a new creation in Jesus Christ. We're denying the power of the cross. We're denying the emotions that God went through whenever Jesus was there on the cross. We're denying all the emotions that Jesus was going through as He was receiving all the punishment that was due to us while He was there on the cross. The new birth makes everything possible. Everything good that could be possible is available to you. You're not going to have to work harder to get some more of it. You're not going to have to have some more faith to get it because if you have faith of Jesus Christ, then you have all the faith. There's no more faith to get. You have all of the Holy Spirit all of the time. And so in Philippians, this is, again, this is a church that Paul was writing a letter to, and he was very thankful for the Philippian church. They were doing pretty good. They had a whole lot of things going in the right direction for them. And Paul was very thankful for them, and he lifted them up, and he praised them, and he had lots of good things to say. And this is how he starts to close out the letter that he wrote to them. And he said, My God shall supply all your need according to His riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Everything that we need to make it through every circumstance. The problem where we run into in our human way of thinking is the timing. His timing is usually where we get messed up. And we get to thinking, man, he's not there because it's not happening as fast as we want it to happen. I'm very impatient. I don't know about y'all. The timing is where I get messed up. But things like this, reading scripture like this and knowing how it was meant to be read and how it was meant to be uh, taken and used really does help whenever it comes to seeing God in the correct light. So, if you've had a bad experience with church, if you've had a bad experience with churchy type people, if you've had a bad experience with these little sayings like this that don't do any good to make you feel any better whatsoever and it's given you a wrong version of God, I think you're in the right place because we believe in His unending total grace. And with that being said, we move to Act 2. Communion. I believe in an open communion. I believe that if you come in here, you have a right uh, as a believer in Jesus Christ to bond together in unity. It's two things that are symbolized in communion. The body and the blood. Two things that are absolutely important for Christian living. And so towards the end of Jesus' life, he got his disciples together before he was getting ready to go to the cross and he gathered them in the upper room to celebrate the Passover, which was very, very important uh, to uh, the Jews at that time. And without them knowing, he got them together for the last Passover that he would be celebrating with them and changed the meaning of it forever for Christians to be celebrating from now on. And I like to put myself in Jesus' place. And I like to get the correct context of the emotions that He was going through whenever He was there in that room. And from my perspective, as I get to stand here every fourth Sunday, every month, and share communion with you, I get a little bit of an idea of how He may have felt. Because whenever I look out at you guys, I see love, I see warmth, I see compassion. I know the things that you guys are doing for ministry in the community and the things that you guys are doing to help people. Probably not all of it, but I know some of it. And I just see how much you guys love each other. And I just have a sense of pride whenever it comes to that. And so I get a little bit of an idea of how Jesus may have felt. And the, the disciples that he was with there in that room, they weren't perfect. They still had plenty of mistakes. They still wasn't getting everything just right. But they loved Him. And they trusted Him. And that was basically the only requirement. And so He set them down and He said that with fervent desire, I've gathered you here together. That meant there was no place that He would rather be at that time than there in that room with those guys. 
They sat down and they were eating and they were sharing a meal and they were sharing conversation. And what they were doing is they were letting that bond grow closer together. This is why I like to do this once a month. You see, there's two ordinances that said was given to the church that Jesus said that we should do. One of them is baptism, and that is uh, making a public display of somebody's faith, and we do that here. We have a, a very nice, state-of-the-art, first-class horse trough that has really nice heaters. I don't think that there's really a better trough anywhere in the tri-state area. And we celebrate baptism that way, and we baptize a lot of people, and it's a lot of fun, and we get to see people... Uh, you know, make their their faith public. And all it's doing is saying that they have died in sin, they've been buried, that old man, and they rise again to the resurrection of Jesus Christ, a brand new believer. The second ordinance that Jesus said that we should be doing is communion. And he said, you got to be doing that often. And so, as a boy growing up in the Methodist church, we took communion once a month, and it was a pretty big deal. And... Before it started, the preacher would always say, hey, if you've been doing some ungodly things this week, don't be taking of this because you'll be taking it wrong. And they'd use that scripture out of context to say that a man should examine himself. But when you go back and you read the scripture and in December, around Christmas time, we have a, a, a service that is nothing but communion and we get into that scripture, but now the people there that were taking it wrong, they were showing up before the service started. They was eating all the food and drinking all the wine. They was getting drunk and full before the main festivities were even there. And Paul says they needed to examine themselves. What you coming for? They wasn't coming for the right reasons. And so I've had that way of thinking my whole life. If I had done some things that I wasn't proud of this week that I probably shouldn't take communion. Then I realized, if I've done some things this week I'm not proud of, I need communion. Yeah. Jesus said that whenever we take communion, we do it in remembrance of Him, not remembrance of our flesh or our feathers. So this is why I believe that communion should be open, because we've all messed up this week. We've all done some things that's it's not good. And that doesn't uh, exclude you from coming in these doors. In fact, that really makes you eligible to be in here, really, because we're still quite messed up ourselves. But let's look to the Scripture here. Jesus is there. He said He took the bread. And if this is your first time with us, on the very top of your juice pack, there's a very thin layer of plastic. You peel that back, and it exposes this little wafer. This wafer symbolizes the bread, which Jesus says there in verse 19. It says He took the bread, gave thanks, and He broke it. And he passed it out to them, and he said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now, this is personal. I like to break mine as symbolizing Jesus' body being broken. And we can go back and read in Isaiah 55. Uh, it talks about uh, that. I really like using that scripture. But Jesus gave his body for us so that we could be his body. But Jesus took a beating of among beatings before he got there to the cross and had to carry his cross up there on the hill. And he knew that was coming. And he did that so that we could gather together in a barn like we are right here today in unity to uh, acknowledge that we are the body of Jesus. And so today we give thanks for that. Father, we'd just like to thank you for the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. We'd like to thank you for uh, him paving the way so that we could have an established, re-established relationship with you that was broken by sin that we inherited down through the ages. So Father, no matter what we could do, we couldn't run away from uh, that punishment of sin on our own. We couldn't get good enough. We couldn't know enough or do anything enough. But Jesus is our answer for that. And so we thank you for the body of Jesus. And we confess and we acknowledge that we are the body that is to carry on his word today. We love you in Jesus' name. From the first book in the Bible, Genesis, whenever the first sin took place, blood was the answer. That has been God's requirement for sin from then, and it is still the test of time, and it is the answer for sin now. Blood. Blood has to be 
uh, given to atone for sin. That has never ever changed. But what happened is whenever Jesus gave up His body, they pierced His side with a sword. They nailed the nails in His, in his wrist and down there at His ankles and His blood dripped out onto the ground and His blood being different than bulls or rams or goats or anything that was ever given before, His blood was perfect because He had never committed any sins. And that blood spilled out on the ground and covered sins once and for all. Forever. That's why we no longer have an altar where we make a burnt offering. We have a prayer altar right here that you can come and use for that. Nothing wrong with that whatsoever. There's not a big altar where we're sacrificing animals anymore. It's not required. This is why we don't do this. Because of Jesus' blood. So verse 20. Peel back the second layer. Exposes the juice. Verse 20. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. And so get this. The New Testament didn't start... Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, it started in Jesus' blood. He showed them in that cup, it was symbolizing His blood was what was going to bring in the new covenant. So whenever you read the Bible and get the right context to understand, you need to understand was things uh, talked about before the blood or after the blood because Jesus was a Jew. He couldn't teach outside of the law. Jesus fulfilled the law by His death. His blood spilling out on the ground covered all sins forever. And so, it's important to understand. And so, in the cup is the new covenant. This is our new operating system. This is the things that you and I get to live under. It's a privilege that we get to live under this today because Jesus fulfilled the requirements of the law. 613 of them. And if He was guilty of one, He was guilty of all of them. And so, it's important to know what we've come from. You see? We don't have to answer to that old way anymore. Looking in this cup, we have freedom. Looking in this cup, we have love. We have acceptance. We have guidance. We have everything that we need. The relationship is restored because of the blood. So Father, we come to you today and we thank you for the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And we recognize that it does for us what we can never do for ourselves. It makes us clean. And so we thank you that we get to live under this new covenant experiencing your grace every day. In Jesus' name, amen. So with that, I look forward to this every month because I feel like it brings us just a little bit closer together every time we do this. I'm very honored and privileged to be able to uh, lead this every month. And i just like to say this. Uh, I don't know how you guys like to do things, but... I believe that this is not just to be done in church. I don't believe it's just to be done uh, once a month. Jesus said do it. Do it often. So if you want to uh, break the law a little bit, take them cups home with you that's on the table right there. Go ahead and steal them. Put them in your pocket. Share them with your neighbor. Have it outside somewhere. Out in the field. Out on, the, out on your property. Out on your front porch. Enjoy communion with people that you love. I think it makes a big, big difference in our life. So... I'm going to go ahead and dismiss with that and let you off the hook today. I appreciate your music very, very much. I love you guys and hope that you have a great week. Leon, you want to pray us out? Father, we'd like to thank you this afternoon for coming together and worship you and your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, Father. We want to give you all the praise and glory and thank you for the many things that you've done for us, the blessings that you do for us. We want to thank you for reaching down and touching those within our community that are sick and, uh, and holding them up, Father. And we pray this in Holy Son's name. Amen. Amen. Amen.